Welcome back to the Dividend Diplomats YouTube channel. You got your boy Bird over there, and you know you're rolling with Lanny, the one, the only, the Dividend Diplomats, here to bring you the Dividend Investing News. And guys, the stock market has been dropping this week of January 24th. We're not going to talk about the headliners, you know, the Microsofts, the T. Rowe prices, the Apple stock. No, we're going to talk about a small company here that is a great dividend growth stock. That's right, everybody. It's always exciting in dividend investing, especially in 2022. We can't wait to just talk to you about this undervalued stock to buy. But before we do, everybody, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel below. Give this video a thumbs up share it help us get there help us keep growing our youtube channel and spreading the word of dividend investing and reaching financial freedom guys we got to twelve thousand, so we just want to say thanks this was that's an awesome threshold you know and even twelve thousand plus subscribers obviously we're looking forward to getting to twenty thousand as the next big hurdle uh oh um, is that going to be when uh Macho Man and Hulk Hogan make a come. Well, you listen up, brother. We can't let the dividend investors down, Jack. Well, that's right, Hulk Lanny. It's going to be an awesome video. We're going to get back together at WrestleMania 20,000 subscribers. That's what it's all about. Well, you heard it right there from Macho Burt. But, guys, the SP 500 over the last two business days, again, we're filming here on. January 25th, but correct me if I'm wrong, I don't even know what day it is. It's January 25th, right? Yep, that's absolutely right. It's a Tuesday. It's 2022. It is. There it is. We're getting close to Groundhog's Day, you know. You know, oh we're getting. God. Yeah. All right, hey, take it easy there, Bert. Now, guys, <laughs> the S&P 500 still is down. You know, again, just today alone, the S&P 500 was down about 54 points or 1.2%. Last five days, they're down 5%. And then year to date, S&P 500 is down 9%. Will it's, they crack below 4,300? That's what I was about to say. It's insane that it's below 4,400. And the way it's trending now, it could get below 4,300. And heck, maybe even 4,200. But let's be real. While others are running to the sidelines, others are nervous, others are scared, we get excited because we look for long-term investment and buying undervalued dividend growth stocks that have a history of increasing their dividend through good times and bad. That's why when others flee, we run in and say, this is our time to pick up some great cheap assets. I want my dividend stocks. I want them now. So guys, this is a great time for dividend investors, investors that are just starting out on their you know, personal finance journey, trying to build passive income. There is no better way than right now uh, to buy dividend growth stocks because, guys, stocks are on sale. They're finally being discounted back to more normalized fair value, really coming down to the mean, which is, you know, we needed this because the S&P 500 was significantly overvalued over the last, oh, I don't know, 12 to 18 months. What, what do you think, Bert? Yeah, I mean, you could argue it still is even slightly overvalued when you stretch it out over the long run and that it might just be correcting here for a little bit to start the, the year. But yeah, it seemed like the stock market could not sustain two or more than two or three down days in a row for that 12 to 18 month period. So it's a little refreshing to see actually have a lot of different opportunities there. I know it's what happened when we put the watch list together. It was actually fun putting the watch list together because it didn't feel like you were scraping for three stocks to buy. You were easily able to find three great stocks. And that's why I'm pumped that just a few days later, Lanny, we're going to be here talking about another undervalued stock to buy to. Exactly. Instead of talking about the traditional stocks that we have been talking about, you know, the T. Rowe Price, the, the store capital stock, Verizon, Unilever, Lionel Basel even, J Johnson & Johnson, their stock has taken a huge whack as well, um, as I believe they didn't hit the estimates that the analysts were expecting. I don't know if that's because of the, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine, but we're actually going into another industry that Bert and I love. We've talked about this industry many times. We're going into not just the banking industry, guys, but we wanted to talk about another smaller regional sized bank that's almost 14 billion in assets. 
That's right. And the community banking sector is the one we love because there are a lot of great undervalued banks that have are very well capitalized, that have strong balance sheets, that have strong dividend yields, and still offer the nuts and bolts products of the suite of products to people in their community. They help out a lot of people nearby. You can do your full service checking, you get your business loan here, but they also avoid a lot of the complicated transactions and a lot of the things that the big banks can get into that could potentially make your balance sheet less stable. So that's why we love this niche sector. And it's an industry that Bert and I know very well, given our backgrounds in banking. Um, so guys, we're talking, we're going to head over to the New Jersey area. We're going to Provident Financial Services. Ticker symbol is PFS for personal financial statements. No, kidding. But yes, their ticker symbol is PFS. And again, at the time of this video, yeah, to ting um, at the time of this video, their stock price was trading at $24.29. We're going to go through the diplomat stock screening metrics. Check them out here below. Again, the first big one is the price to earnings ratio that I know everybody here loves. But this bank bird is a growing bank. Um, and not to mention just that, but they also just established a new CEO and president earlier this year, about two weeks ago, which was the chief operating officer for the bank, um, which came in from an acquisition they had from a few years ago. So they have quite a little bit of a shakeup going on right now. But, you know, Bert, you know, kind of give a few highlights from that last quarter three earnings release as we anticipate quarter four. Sure, absolutely. One of the ones we always look for, banks are measured by their balance sheet and their total assets there. That's how you judge the size of a bank. Their total assets, as we mentioned here, are 13 billion. So it's a lar it's on the larger side of the community banking sector. It's above, above some of the big $10 billion thresholds that I know a lot of banks would try to get to in the past before they loosened up some of the regulations on that area. So 13 billion is nothing to sneeze at. Assets grew $400 million in 2021 over the first nine months. So that's a pretty decent amount there for a $13 billion it's, institution. In, in the words of my Italian relatives, it's a good, it's a good. Yeah, it is good. You don't have to be Italian to know that that's trending in the right direction. I know one of the other things too that jumped out of there is the bank's ROE is 10.45% so far through there. I know typically for banks, what you're looking for is an ROE that is above 10%. That's the metric we use. So it's great to see them cross that bar. And last, Lanny, the efficiency ratio, it measures, it says exactly what the name is, how efficient an institution is, how much can they, how lean are their expenses, how lean are their operations. That is what the efficiency ratio measures. To a bank that's in the 50%, that's a very low efficiency ratio. Most are in the 60%. If you see 70%, eh, you know there's some trap, some fat to trim there at the bank. So an efficiency ratio of 54% to us indicates that is a lean bank and they are squeezing a lot out of their employees. There's a little bit of that Hellman's Mayo that Bert loves. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of logged in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, the efficiency ratio, thank goodness there's actually one financial ratio that is what it says. It determines your efficiency. You yeah, know, I know how, you feel bad when you define it and you say it just measures how efficient an institution is, but that's really it. Guys, if you still haven't yet, definitely hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit that notification bell uh, before we jump into the dividend stock metrics here for Provident Financial Services. So, Bert, let's go into that first metric here on why, why we're looking at Provident Financial Services. Because, guys, if you didn't remember, back when I was, uh, I actually sold out of People's uh, Bancorp United, PBCT, once they were getting acquired by MNT. I put that all over Twitter, all over the blog. Um, I moved on from my position there and actually moved into here back when they were trading in that 17 to 19 range. So, they've actually had quite the appreciation. Um, up to this point, again, trading at $24.29 for PFS. So, Bert, dive into the first metric here. Yeah, so let's see that even though the share price has jumped up, let's see if the metrics today are showing signs of undervaluation. Remember, for banks, we always sneak in that extra valuation metric. We're going to look at the price-to-earnings ratio, and then we're going to look at the price-to-book ratio because the industry goes by the price-to-book ratio as well. So both metrics will show is provident undervalued. Price is 24.29 at the close at the end of this video. 
forward EPS 184. That gives you a PE ratio of 13.2, half the market. So yeah, it's undervalued with PE wise compared to the market price to book. Lanny, what do we look for typically when we are comparing the price to book ratio? Typically you want to see under 1.25. You know, if you can get it somehow at one or below, that means like, wow, the stock price is below what literally equity the, value, <laughs> the equity of yeah the equity of the institution so that's always a sign of possible undervaluation or could be a sign of trouble but um you know so here for provident financial services per that price to book ratio on this big nice size regional bank they were at 1.12 so slightly higher than lcmb that we reviewed when we were reviewing lcmb and uh you know dimeco uh, but still not too bad. Yeah, no, I mean, that was great. I mean, it's below the 1.25. So if you look and you compare the price to book for the industry and you typically would scan and say, here, what are the cheapest ones? This one would definitely pop up on the list because that is a very well. So they passed both those metrics. Let's move into two payout ratio. We look at below 60 percent. The perfect payout ratio is between 40 percent and 60 percent. Providence dividend is 96 cents. Divide that by EPS of 184. That gives you a perfect payout ratio of 52%. Rock on there with that perfect dividend. So what is 52%? You know, again, when Bert and I see this metric at 52%, they're pretty much a reinvesting half of their earnings back in the business and then paying the other half back out to the shareholders. Safety is there in the dividend, not of a risk of being cut. And there is still room for dividend growth, which Bert, that's that third dividend metric. What's it look like? Excellent segue. Five-year dividend growth rate, 6%. They don't have the longest dividend increase streak, though. It's not zero. It's not two. It's somewhere in between. That gives it one. They have increased that dividend for one consecutive year. Right, you're like, read between the lines. Yeah, uh, hey. Hey, you take it hey, easy, Lanny. You hey, take it hey. easy here. Now, the reason why I do want to talk about this, the reason why it's only one year is because during the pandemic, they did not increase their dividend. Uh, and what they're typically known for when you look at the dividend history for Provident Financial, they're actually known for a lot of special dividends. Um, so they do usually do one of those. We're not considering it at all in this analysis. Uh, but during the pandemic, they did not increase their dividend. Okay, fine. They didn't. So 20, 2023, it was 23 cents. 2020, they stayed at 23. And then they resumed the increases in 2021. So again, that 6% five-year average includes a 0% goose egg in the analysis. Yeah. Hey, I mean, still great. I mean, Despite that, they still have a long-term history going up. They have the long-term history of rewarding the shareholders, and they're still they're earning machines there because that ROE is over ten percent. Let's and look. At I will, and I will have to say this: back at the first metric, they should blow the cover off that forward earnings expectations of a dollar eighty-four. Just saying. Let's see. See what there's all say. Numbers talk. Ball doesn't lie. But I will say that through nine months this year. You know, earnings per share is a dollar seventy two through nine months. Can they beat five cents per share in the fourth quarter? We'll find out. That's what we got to find out, Lanny. Uh, no, no, they were at a dollar seventy two, so they need to beat twelve cents. But all right, twelve cents, same thing. We'll see. Odds are they got it, but it's not guaranteed. That's why you go with the numbers. Here is there all don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> is there a nice impairment charge? Is there some bad loans that popped up there? Who knows? We'll find out when the results are released. Anyway, um, let's move into that bonus metric. I'm well out of I, I'm getting slap happy here, so let's keep this moving along here. Bonus metric, dividend yield 3.95%. So on the cusp of crossing 4%, which would be absolutely huge for the institution. And the price doesn't fall far to get there. Yeah, I mean, a 4% yield almost with a 6% growth rate. Yeah, you've got about a 10% dividend compound factor right there. Yep. All right, so let's summarize here. PE ratio, 13.2. Price to book, 1.12. Payout ratio, 52%. Five-year dividend growth rate, 6%. 
increase for one year, however, as Lanny said, they kept it still for one year, but they have a history of increasing in special dividends. In that bonus metric, the dividend yield is 3.95%. Lanny, what's put you on the spot? What are you doing right now with Provident? If you, you smell how what Lanny is cooking here with Provident Financial Services, they're, they're on my watch list. I'm loving it. Um, I do want to see them come. I want to see them see if they break below $24 per share. I do own a little bit of them, but hey, I like the community bank space. Love the community bank space. Um, strong signs of undervaluation. Get a 4% yield with an above average dividend growth rate. What's not to like about it with um, a conservative earnings expectation? <laughs> <laughs> conservative to say the least. I agree. Nothing more I can really add. I think it's earned a spot on the watch list for obvious reason. Let's see what happens when they release these fourth quarter earnings and the year-to-date figures as well. Everybody, let us know in the comments section, what do you think of Provident? Are you looking at any other community banks that are jumping on your radar? We'd love to know, do you have any other community banks that have a 4% yield and a price-to-book ratio below 1.25? Please leave those in the comment section below. Guys, it's all about dividend investing, adding to your passive income total on that journey to financial freedom. Let's all get there together. Let's keep buying dividend stocks, you know, right here, right now. Let's do as much as we can because the best day was yesterday, but the next best day is today. Right, Bert? That's, that's right. And if you haven't, subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up, everybody. Let's keep crushing it in 2022. Guys, we appreciate it. That was Bert and this was Lanny from the Dividend Diplomats. Over and out.